Here we go. Um, welcome to the 415 session in room 321. Um, this session is How to Report a Vulnerability, Responsible Disclosure for Developers by Brian Demers. Hi, everyone. Um, so I, I think this is an important topic to, to discuss. I don't, I don't think a lot of us really learn uh, much about vulnerabilities, as, especially as young developers. I know most of our first jobs, we probably talk about, you know, uh, bug reporting is probably like a, a first, first day on the new job type of thing. Everybody does that slightly different, but everybody knows how to report a bug. Um, but we don't do a very good job of, of training people. Uh, people later in their careers and especially people early in their careers on the the vulnerability aspect of, of, of this. So um, I've been wanting to give this talk for a while. So uh, so that's where this came from. Oops, my uh, my cursor is not working. Let's try. There we go. All right. So a little bit more about me and my background. Uh, I, I like to, to tell everybody um, a little bit about me just to, to inform what how I uh, created my biases, right? So my opinions are, are largely based on, on what I've done in the past. Um, I've been a Java developer pretty much my whole career, right? So, uh, so I'm a fan of static languages. Um, uh, I'm a developer advocate at a company called Okta. I, I've done a lot of our uh, developer um, tooling, so SDKs, integrations, those types of things, um, mostly working for, with other developers. I'm an Apache Shiro, um, Committer, so I'm the project uh, on the project management committee. So it's a Java security framework, um, and I've spent a bunch of time in sort of the build and tooling space in the Java world. Um, so I really like builds. Uh, and, and some people sort of uh, question why it's I you know I've done some build and some security stuff, but it sort of um, shows how invasive security is into everything we do. Um, so I started in this doing some security work um, because of you know build related servers, right? So as soon as you want to connect to a, a web server, um, there's some, some security involved and, and that's what led me down this path. Um, and on the side, I'm also a beekeeper as of the past few years. Um, so that's, that's sort of what I do in my spare time. And um, I'm also in New Hampshire, a couple hours north of, of uh, well, I guess it's remote, but a couple hours where the conference used to be or was going to be. Uh, and as I mentioned, I, I work at Okta. I'm, I'm not a sales guy. I'm not going to give you a sales pitch. Uh, but on a high level, Okta is uh, authentication as a service. So we do user management, login, multi-factor authentication. But the thing that I want everyone to take away is, is these things are hard. I'm not saying you should use Okta, but I am saying you probably shouldn't be writing this type of logic yourself. And again, it's not a sales pitch, so we'll just keep moving. So today, there are a few things I want to cover. Um, so what is a vulnerability? How do we report them responsibly? Um, you know, how do you report these issues? And, and I'm going to give you a few tips on how to make it easier for people uh, to report security issues with your projects. And so I, I feel terrible that I have to say this, but obviously uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I know in years past, people have been a bit paranoid, uh, you know, with a little fear of retaliation of legal action when, when people report vulnerabilities. Uh, personally, I don't, I really don't worry about these things. Um, you know, as long as you're communicating with the right people. Um, but, you know, for example, I probably wouldn't call up the CEO of a mom and pop shop and tell them uh, I found a vulnerability in the product, right? They're, they're the right people to talk to. Uh, well, in that case, that's the wrong person to talk to, but there are the right person to talk to and um, to, to get that information. So I have contacted the Amazon security team before. Um, so I'm not a, I'm not a security researcher, you know, but I play one on TV. Um, so th this one's a little silly, but, but I like to start with an example. So as you can see on the top here, uh, this is a URL. This, this, this actually worked. This was a screenshot of my account. Um, I don't know, probably a little over a year ago. Um, so as you can see, I changed the, the, this coupon value to be a million dollars and lo and behold, my screen showed, um, I've redeemed a million dollar coupon. This is, this is great. This is awesome. Right. But, um, that really wasn't the case. So you can see in the top right of the screenshot that my coupon balance is still five. So uh, Amazon was actually doing a lot of validation of this number um, on the back end. So they weren't susceptible to like cross-site cross -site scripting attacks and things like that. Um, so, but they were just checking to see if this value was a number, but it could be any number. Um, but that's not necessarily saying that this number was applied to my account. 
but it, it, does, it did look a little weird. So I contacted them. Uh, they, they sent it on to the right people. It sort of sat in uh, you know, low priority bug land for a while, I'm sure, for them. And then they, they eventually fixed it. Um, so the last time I got a coupon, this, this was no longer uh, an issue. Um, but you know, is this a vulnerability, right? Like I wasn't able to exploit anything, but in my view, I, I do think this is a vulnerability. I was able to change something on somebody's, uh, on, on, a, on somebody's browser. Um, and if I was, you know, a bit more nefarious, I could, I could have tried to sell, you know, $10 coupons for $2 a piece or something, um, to, to people, which would have caused, um, you know, support issues. And it's, it just, it's, it's silly, but. Like I said, I, I think it's a low level issue. So what is, what is a vulnerability, right? So the Oxford Dictionary says that a vulnerability is, is basically the state of, uh, of being exposed to attack. And then more specifically, um, you know, Wikipedia says for computing, uh, a vulnerability is a weakness that can be exploited by an attacker. So more or less the same thing um, the first definition also has uh, some emotional uh, components to it, but um, you know I get pretty emotional when people support uh, when people report issues wrong. So uh, maybe maybe that's the same. So what about a CVE? So a lot of times we hear about CVEs and how are those related to to vulnerabilities? Uh, well, CVE stands for Common Vulnerability Exposure. So everything I'm going to talk about starts with the word common. That's somebody. Got a kick on it, I guess. Um, but basically, it, it's a CVE is a way of describing um, a vulnerability uh, across multiple data sources. So lots of different people have have you know vulnerability databases, but the, the CV, CVE or the CVE ID is essentially the primary key that we're talking about. And these IDs are handed out by common numbering authorities such as uh, MITRE, um, and and but. And we typically use these IDs uh, because not all vulnerabilities get a cool name like Heartbleed, right? Um, usually, we just refer to the refer to a vulnerability by this ID. And not all CVEs are actually vulnerabilities. So this one in particular that I'm sharing here, um, the person who reported this issue reported it publicly, which is incorrect, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but they they didn't understand what what Python's virtual environment was. They thought they had figured out some way to, to create some sort of shell escape, um, but really it's, it's just managing your Python environment, not a virtual environment like a, like a virtual machine. So I also wanna stress how common vulnerabilities are. So this graph is the last few years uh, of the, the CVEs per month that have been reported. And I pulled this data from, um, from NIST uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm not quite sure what happened in May of 2017. That may have been when the first sort of um, speculative execution attacks started happening. Um, I, I don't know, but that, that was a terrible month for somebody. Um, but so, so on average, this is, this is 1,500 vulnerabilities per month, right? So that's like 50 a day. That's super common, right? That, that's that's a, lot, a lot of issues reported. Um, so I think this number is actually much, much higher because these are just the issues that are publicly reported. These aren't things that, that aren't reported or, or uh, you know, private companies have found and they fixed and they've just not reported them publicly. So more, more words that start with, with common. Um, so a CVSS is a common vulnerability scoring system. Uh, so this is a bit complex and I really personally don't um, worry about the scoring system too much. Um, there, there is a calculator if you really need to go, go figure out what the score is. So here's the gist, right? So a CVE gets, uh, gets a score. Ideally, you know, a, a big vulnerability, a big scary one would have a high number and, and you know, something you don't worry about as much would get a low number. However, these are very different between depending on your actual environment. So just to break this down a little bit, we have over here on the left, the, the base metric group. So these are the metrics that are constant over time and environment. And, and I'll explain, uh, the, the next two will, will help explain what I mean by constant uh, time and environment. So the exploitability represents the thing that's being, uh, that is vulnerable. 
and the impact represents the results of that vulnerability. So maybe it's a permission escalation, maybe it's a uh, remote, uh, you know, um, a code injection attack or something like that. So the middle one is the temporal metric group. So this changes over time, but not environment. So say a utility uh, to exploit this issue was released in the wild, you know, maybe through Metasploit or some other, you know, uh, script kitty tool that would raise the issue, uh, sorry, raise the score. And if, it, if the vendor releases a fix or a patch, that would lower the score. And then the environment uh, metric group is something specific to a single person or, you know, a company's uh, environment. Right. And, and maybe you have, you're running software that is vulnerable to that has a CVE, but your company is not vulnerable because you're, you're blocking it with a firewall or some other means. So um, to try to wrap up the, the jargon here, we also have two other things that uh, I think are important to, to know, but are less important to know to under, to when you're, when you're reporting vulnerabilities. Most of these things are, are done by the a vendor, whoever's fixing the issue. Um, but if you look up a CVE, you'll see these pretty, pretty common. So we have a CWE, which is the common weakness enumeration. So this is a list of say 800, uh, I don't know, 800 something um, classifications of issues and they get pretty involved. Um, I think it's, it's 800 something. So I think it's a little hard to navigate. But you know, the first one I think is basically permission, uh, permission, permission escalation. And the second one is a code injection attack. So last on the list of definitions here is the common platform enumeration. So as you can see, uh, this is the name of basically a product, right? And more specifically, it has information about the product. So the first one here is Microsoft Windows. So Windows XP, uh, obviously it's service pack three and it's running on x86 hardware. Uh, I'm not sure what each one of those, those fields are. They're, they're defined. Um, you can go look it up. There's a big spec for the CPE version 2.3. Uh, more commonly, what I deal with, I deal with a lot of Java, Java things, as I mentioned before. So our, our CPEs generally look like the second one. So this, in this case, would be uh, Apache Stretch. That's an Apache... Uh, Software Foundation project called Struts or Struts 2. Um, I do want to stress that these CPEs do not line up to the coordinates of your dependency manager. So I'm going to use, again, uh, the Java ecosystem, but the same holds true for, for other projects or other ecosystems as well. So in the, in the Java world, we would typically refer to um, a Struts dependency, something that looks like this. There has been attempts to try to match them automatically, um, but there's a lot of false positives. So it's uh, the, the, the vendors that are, are really doing this type of vulnerability scanning um, oftentimes match these by hand, which is a, a lot of work. So the question I, I pose to you is, are our CVEs bad? Right, so if we were all in the same room, I would tell everybody to raise their hand, but we're virtual and, and I probably won't see the, the, the chat window pop up anyway. Um, but then I would probably ask, you know, how many of you think I'm asking a trick question? And, and maybe a maybe few, few less would, would raise their hand. So in my opinion, they're good, right? So what CVEs really do is they provide a standard way for us to talk about security issues. And we all know that software bugs are a fact of life. Uh, and it's, so it's just how we deal with them that makes them good or bad. So an example of the good is we have this project, Apache Tomcat, which is a, is a very popular uh, Java web server. And I think it's a great example of how CVEs are reported and handled. So if you go to their project website, you can see um, each, ver each version of their software has a list of, of vulnerabilities. And of course, you can go to the standard um, NIST or, or MITRE CVE databases and find this information as well. The, the, the point I'm trying to make here is this information is available and it's pretty easy to find. So it gives developers and system admins notice uh, to go update and patch their systems. And of course, there's the bad, right? So many of us have heard of, of Spectre. 
So it's one of the speculation, uh, speculative execution attacks that as of late, uh, and these have sucked. Um, so Intel, Intel CEO allegedly um, sold off a bunch of stock before this, bef before this issue went public. So after they found out about it and before it went public, and I'll get to that time frame in a minute here. But that's that's probably pretty poor handling. Um, and some of these issues have been a massive pain in the ass, right? Like Spectre meltdown, Heartbleed, they cause many folks to work a lot of overtime hours. Um, and in some of these cases, the, the patches actually decrease performance of the computers, right? So it actually costs real money to, to fix them and continue running those same computers. So now we're getting into disclosure. Right, so going back to the Oxford Dictionary, disclosure all by itself is the action of making secret information known. And so responsible disclosure is, is basically keeping something a secret until it can be fixed, you know, within a, an agreed upon time. Like I'm gonna give you a certain period of time to go fix the issue. If you don't fix it, I'm gonna tell people anyway. Uh, which is opposed to full disclosure, which is tell everyone right now, right away. So the idea with full disclosure is it gives users and admins uh, all the info they need to make their own decisions, but it also gives the attackers the same information. And in often cases, uh, attackers are more likely to be able to exploit the issue than um, a system admin is to be able to fix it. Um, maybe there's no patch for the system admin. Maybe their only alternative is to shut off the machine. Maybe it's a mission critical machine, they can't shut it off. You know, what, what are they going to do, right? So the idea is to try to keep things a secret uh, as long as possible until a fix is released. So in my view, responsible disclosure is almost always the, the best option uh, because once information is out there, once it's disclosed, once it's public, it's impossible to take it back. So even if you think full disclosure is the better option, you can always start with reporting something responsibly and then, um, you know, escalate it if you really feel you need to. And the, the other, one more point I want to make, so Microsoft and a few others call responsible disclosure, co coordinated disclosure, and it means the same thing. So um, early in my career, uh, I had heard the term embargo floated around. Uh, I was working at a company, we were doing some packaging for, for um, packaging of binaries for distribution. I had no clue what they were talking about. Um, so I just figured they were talking about some sort of trade sanctions or I, I didn't know what was going on. I felt a little too embarrassed to ask. And then someone added, mentioned security embargo. And then, uh, you know, then I, then I understood it's also something you can go Google. Um, but essentially a security embargo is the period of time before the issue is disclosed. So after it's been reported and before it's been disclosed, that period of time is the security embargo. Um, so how long should this period be? So that depends who you ask. So if Google's project zero is 90 days. That's their, that's their default. Um, but they've also published Microsoft security issues within seven days. Uh, and that was before the issue was actually fixed. So this, this pissed a few people off. Um, and the same goes the other way, the specter, which I just mentioned that actually was, was, um, the security embargo lasted eight months before it was finally leaked out. The Linux kernel is actually an interesting one. So they have two, their, their, um, their time frame is two weeks. It's actually something like 19 days, which is two weeks plus a few extra days for to account for holidays on, on each side. So the question I pose to you to think about, you know, when you're thinking about how long should a security embargo be would be, and, you know, how long does it take you to fix a non-security related issue, right? Is it, and, and get that fixed to your customers. Is it days, is it weeks, is it months? Uh, I know I've personally worked in all of those buckets. So I, I have a couple projects that I could probably get out in days. I definitely have a few projects that would be, you know, weeks. And I've definitely worked on projects that would take um, at least a month to get out. And going back to Linux kernel, um, you know, one of the reasons why that's much shorter is there's a lot of eyeballs in that project. So Linus's a GitHub project for the kernel has 30,000 forks and something like almost 90,000 stars. So that's a lot of people watching that code base. 
So there's also this, this great uh, uh, paper. So this is a little overkill for what we're talking about here, but I think it's funny. So David Robert Grimes wrote a paper called The Viability of Conspir Conspiratorial Beliefs. He's actually trying to create a mathematical model to disprove, you know, um, like the moon landing hoax, saying that, you know, uh, the likelihood of that being a hoax is obviously very, very low. Uh, and he creates a mathematical model to prove this. Obviously, the, the TLDR here is the longer you wait, the more likely it is your secret will get out. And if anyone's ever heard this quote from Benjamin Franklin, he puts it a little more succinctly, which is uh, three people may keep a secret if two of them are dead. Okay, I joke about this, but you know, think about how fast information travels today. Uh, you know, we're seeing firsthand how you know physical touch and contact uh, is affecting the world right now. Just think about um, you know how fast digital information travels. So here we go. So how are vulnerabilities actually reported? So I'm going to get into each each one of these these sections in a minute here, but but essentially the the overview is that you you report the issue to some project, the vendor or the owner of that project, you know, vendor company, open source project, whatever it is, fixes or patches that product, and then they disclose the information publicly. So I like to refer to this as report, fix, disclose. So if you go to the OWASP website, I think they actually uh, list, list this similar type of, of process out in multiple steps. I think the first three are all about gathering information and in, in reporting. Um, we, I think as developers, we sort of all know how to report uh, a bug. So gathering that information is, is sort of second nature. So I think compressing this down to report, fix, disclose, makes it a little easier to remember. So getting into the first one in a little more detail. So you're going to report the issue privately and that's the biggest change. So this is what requires the most work. And honestly, this is all you need to do when you're reporting a bug. Everything else is generally up to the vendor. The problem here is each project or, or company or vendor handles this slightly different. Just like we all use different bug trackers, right? Um, you're going to have to go search out how to find this information on, on a given vendor's website. Oftentimes they have uh, a mailing list, like a security at, you know, example.com. Um, if you can't find that, you know, you can check bug bounty sites like bug crowd or hacker one, um, you know, for smaller shops, you know, maybe you want to email their support and just ask them how to report a, a vulnerability or where their security pages. Maybe you don't want to email support directly the, the vulnerability, but you do want to ask them what the correct route is. And if all else fails, you know, you could use an anonymous email account and email them if, if, you're, if you're really worried. So I want to stress this again, do not use a public bug tracker. So if, if you take nothing away from, nothing else away from this talk, uh, this slide is burning into your brain. Don't use a public bug tracker. So this is an issue that, that I actually helped fix. Um, so the reporter opened this issue and then more or less ghosted us. You know, some people just scan public open source repositories looking for specific types of problems. Uh, and you know, to, to help gain uh, reputation or pad the resume, which I'm actually all in favor of, I think that's great. Uh, it's just how you report them is the problem. So you don't just open a bug, right? You need to report them responsibly, give the developers time to fix them. And, and, you know, it's not just bug trackers, right? I, I've seen the same thing on mailing lists and Stack Overflow and, and pretty much everywhere. If, if it's public, that's not the right way to report uh, an issue. Even if you think it's a security issue or think it's, it could potentially be a security issue, treat it sensitively. Um, you know, some, some public bug trackers actually will have a checkbox to say if it's private or not. Uh, that's a great option, except I would, I would, still look for the proper, whatever the company recommends you use to report vulnerabilities, uh, because you don't know how the bug tracker is, is managed. You don't know who has access to it. You're trying to keep the, you know, the, the, the number of people as small as possible. Obviously, if you can't find some other means, then, you know, by all means, click that private button. Um, but, you know, it's, you gotta, you gotta try to, 
try to do what you can. So PGP. So the next thing I want to talk about is encrypting content. Usually you don't need to do this, but in almost all cases, if you go find somebody's security page, you'll see a link to their PGP key. Uh, and this is so if you need to uh, encrypt information, you want to make sure that only your eyes and the security team sees it, nobody in the middle, um, then you can go this route. So essentially, again, you're scouring um, the company's website, you're going to come across something that looks like this. So this one is from Okta. Uh, you know, again, it's just uh, the PGP key and you can cut and paste that that key in the bottom. Amazon has something similar. And then the Apache Software Foundation has, it manages it slightly different. They actually don't have a team key. They have individual keys. Uh, and they actually recommend uh, if, if you don't, don't, do, don't follow, sorry, they actually recommend not encrypting if you, unless you really feel you need to. It's not something that people, we think you need to do. So anyway, so you grab their, their, their public key. Um, you take your data. You run it through GPG or some PGP tool. You get an encrypted file and you email that to somebody. And on the other end, they get that file, the encrypted file, they take their private key, which nobody else has access to, and they decrypt it, and then they have the original file again. Like I said, um, generally you don't need to worry about this. You know, a simple email to their security team is usually all that you need to do. So the fix, so the fix is up to the vendor or the project. So now that the issue has been reported, we're sort of starting our, our, our window, you know, maybe, maybe the company is confirmed with you. They say, yes, that this is an issue. Thank you for reporting it. Um, so if it's an open source project and you want to get involved, that's awesome. Just stay in contact with them because you probably are not going to, to deal with, um, a security issue the same way as you would a normal pull request or, or, or issue. You know, your, your commit log might actually need to be a bit sparse or your pull request message might actually be, need to be uh, lacking in information, right? And that's because it's not time to disclose the, the issue yet. So anyway, regardless of, of how it actually gets fixed, you know, everybody does something different. Vendors have different processes. You know, it goes through the, the, the vendor's workflow. Um, they make the, the project, uh, they make the fix public. And this means different things for different folks, right? So for Java projects, we typically publish binaries of so jar files. Um, Microsoft would, would release a patch on patch Tuesday and source based projects like PHP, they might just cut a tag and call it a day. So now that we've reported the issue, it's been fixed, it's been, it's been out, it's been released to the public, now it's finally time to disclose the issue. So this is the first time that the information has been released to the public. Um, and, and again, the, the, typically the vendor will handle all of this. So they handle getting the CVE ID, attaching it to their, their vulnerability, describing it, all of those things that falls on the vendor that does not fall on somebody reporting it. All you do is essentially, you know, that initial contact, maybe some follow-up information if somebody's having trouble reproducing the bug, and then the vendor of the project is doing everything else. Um, so anyway, so the vendor or the, the project discloses the issue. Now, if you want, now you can go talk about it. You can go share what you've learned. You can go blog about it. Tell your friends, your security researcher, whatever you want to do. Um, or not, you know, some places will actually pay you not to talk about it and not to publicly disclose the issue. So that's, that's up to you if you want to talk about it or not. So the Apache Software Foundation, I know I've mentioned them a lot. I, 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 that's sort of where, how I learned how to do a lot of these processes. So this is the, the reference I use constantly. And I've used uh, this source particularly um, multiple times for even for non Apache projects. So I think it's a great um, source of information for anybody's project. Obviously you have to tweak it a little bit, how you, you know, uh, sorry, this, this, this process is a step-by-step -step guide of dealing with vulnerabilities for someone who's fixing them. Right, so how to request uh, a CVE. In this case, you know, you're going through Apache. For other projects, there's, there's other ways to request them. It's relatively easy. It's just a form you fill out. 
But anyway, so if you have an open source project or, or even a, a, you know, any project, I would say taking a quick look at this list um, is a great idea to, to help you figure out how you would deal with vulnerabilities in your projects. So I promised I would talk about a couple things you can do for your projects to make it a little easier uh, for people who are reporting issues to not report them uh, incorrectly, you know, to, to force people to report them responsibly. Because, you know, many of us have, you know, open source projects and we use public bug trackers and we have some public facing component you need to, to, to worry about. So, um, Spring Security uses uses GitHub, and and you can do the same thing without um, without GitHub. But I'm using GitHub as an example because a lot of us are at least familiar with that. But anyway, Spring Security is a popular Java framework, security framework. Um, so obviously they're very concerned about making sure vulnerabilities are reported correctly. So GitHub lets you create issue templates. They've created an issue template, um, issue issues underscore template. MD. And they've stuck at basically an HTML comment on the top of that. So if you're going to report security issues, go here instead. Now, so over on the left hand side, you see, you know, the, the raw file. Uh, and on the right hand side, if I go create an issue uh, under the Spring Security Project, this is what I see, right? So I know instantly right away that, um, you know, the top of my bug report has it has me thinking should i open this bug here or should i go somewhere else now if i leave that there this comment there that's fine right because it's a comment it's not going to get rendered to anybody's page it's not going to get indexed um so it doesn't cause any harm so the the beauty here is it's, it's just there and people can either ignore it if they wish they can delete it, it doesn't matter but they've seen it so we're trying to get um, the reporter to the right place as soon as possible So another option is a security, security.txt file. So you can go to securitytext.org and, and learn about this format, but essentially it's, it's more or less the same as a robots.txt file. For, for a given domain, you stick this file at the root of your domain. Um, so example.com slash dot well-known slash security.txt. Um, and it contains basically, you know, a couple key value pairs, you know, where to, where to go to, to contact uh, the right person, your, your PGP encryption key, any acknowledgements. There's actually a whole bunch of other keys, to, uh, properties to like, I think preferred language and a few other things like that. Um, but the, the great thing here is if you go to this website, securitytext.org, they have a little form and you can create one of these files um, with, with a few cl clicks of a button. And it's all public information, right? Because it's going on your website. So you could fill it out, click the submit button, and you end up with a text file, and you drop that on your domain, and that's it. That's all you have to do. So again, the idea is to help people discover the right way to report issues, and this could be used either by people or you know you could have um, automated tooling to go scan for for this this URL. So that's all I had. I'm, I'm, I'm a few minutes short here, but hopefully somebody has some questions they want to ask. Oh, do I need to unmute everybody? <laughs> Anyone can chime in? If not, happy hour starts in, uh, in a few minutes, right? Yep, I think at 5.15, um, there'll be a talk, there'll be a, I forget which room it is, but yeah, I, I know Kelly linked to it in Slack somewhere. Um, looks like it's the room, the coffee networking one um, at 5.15. It'll be, it's a happy hour. It says, feel free to take off or just a break and then join in. Um, as people join, we will just chat until we get over 10 people, and then we'll use Zoom breakout rooms to pair up in various ways to discussing icebreakers. Cool. We'll also generate and share what the su summit highlights were and then what we are looking forward to for the following day. So it's optional. If people, really, if people want to join, that would be great. If not, um, then we'll see you tomorrow. All right. 
I'm going to stop recording this too before I forget to do that. Awesome.